Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Caring for Individuals with Alzheimer's Disease conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. Should you require assistance on today's call, please press star then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to our host, Ms. Amy Herr. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and welcome to the call. My name is Amy Herr, and I'm a managing consultant with the Lewin Group. Lewin is a healthcare consulting company in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Geriatric Competent Care webinar series um, and today's call on care transitions to and from the hospital for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. This webinar is the third in our series of webinars related to Alzheimer's disease presented in conjunction with Community Catalyst and the Lewin Group and supported by the Medicare and Medicaid Coordina Coordination Office within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, we'd also like to note that continuing medical education and continuing education credit is available for today's webinar from the American Geriatric Society and the National Association of Social Workers. In order to receive credit, um, participants must read the learning objectives and the, the faculty disclosures, complete the pretest by 1220 Eastern Time, about 15 minutes from now. Um, participate in today's webinar, complete the post-test with a score of at least 80% by 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and complete the program evaluation form um, by 5 p.m. Eastern Time today. Um, the CME and CE certificates will be mailed in approximately four to eight weeks. Um, the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office at CMS is developing technical assistance and actionable item tools based on successful innovations and in care models, such as this webinar series. To learn more about their current efforts, please visit resourcesforintegratedcare.com for more details. Additionally, today's slides are posted on the uh, resourcesforintegratedcare.com website if you'd like to have a copy um, during the presentation. And please contact RIC at lewin.com if you have any questions or comments. And before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that microphones will be muted throughout the presentation, but there'll be a Q&A opportunity at the end of the call. Um, if you have a question during the call, you can submit it through the Q&A feature on the uh, WebEx platform. And we'll select some uh, questions from that list um, to ask during the Q&A portion of the call. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Renee Marcus Hoden. Um, Renee is the director of the Voices for Better Health program at Community Catalyst, a nonprofit consumer advocacy group based in Boston. Renee, we're really happy to have you um, with us today as our moderated, moderator, and I'd like to hand it over to you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you today and to know that so many were able to join us uh, during a pretty busy fall. So. To respect everyone's busy schedule, I'm going to jump right in and introduce our three speakers to you. Our first speaker is Dr. Katherine Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal is an assistant professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and serves as a delirium content expert for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, delirium grant at Houston Methodist Hospital System. Dr. Agarwal has focused her career on the development and implementation of multidisciplinary patient care programs for hospitalized elders and clinical education in geriatric medicine. Among her many activities and accomplishments, she's developed novel online education models on delirium. Dr. Agarwal was a 2014 practice change leader and focused her project on boosting transitions of care for patients with cognitive impairment. Our second speaker is Dr. Karen Rose. Uh, Dr. Rose joins us from the University of Virginia School of Nursing, where she is the director of the PhD program. Dr. Rose focuses her program of research in supporting family caregivers of persons with dementia as these caregivers strive to maintain their loved ones in their home environments for as long as possible. She also conducts research in family quality of life in dementia and in transitional care for older adults. 
At UVA, Dr. Rose teaches in the Interprofessional Series for Nursing and Medical Students on Transitional Care for Older Adults with Dementia. And our third speaker today is Dr. Eric Coleman. Dr. Coleman is actually filling in today for Dr. Alan Stevens, the Director of the Center for Applied Health Research at Baylor Scott and White Health, as well as the Director of the Program on Aging and Care. Unfortunately, Dr. Stevens was called away because of a family emergency, and we're grateful to Dr. Coleman for stepping in to present Dr. Stevens' slides and helping out on a topic he knows quite well. Dr. Coleman is Professor of Medicine and Head of the Division of Healthcare Policy and Research at the University of Colorado. He's the Director of the Care Transitions Program aimed at improving quality and safety during times of care handoffs. Dr. Coleman also serves as the Executive Director of the Practice Change Leaders, a national program to develop, support, and expand the influence of organizational leaders who are committed to achieving transformative improvements in care for older adults. So as you can see, we have a dream team of clinical providers and researchers on today's topic of care transitions. Next slide, please. Before I hand the presentation over to our first speaker, I would like to uh, ask you all to take a few quick polls to see who we have on the call today. Our first poll is the following. Which of the following best describes your professional area? Healthcare administration, medicine, nursing or physician assistant, education, social work, advocacy, or other? If you could submit one by clicking on the radio button and hitting submit answer, we'll have the results shortly. We'll just wait another couple seconds. Okay, let's see what our findings look like. So it looks like the majority of folks on the call today um, uh, are from the social work field, uh, followed by medicine, nursing, and physician assistant. Um, great. Let's do one more uh, a poll, um, which is the question of what setting you work in. Um, if you could check one of the radio buttons, home care, ambulatory care setting, community-based organization, managed care organization, consumer organization, or again, other. Again, hit the radio button and hit submit answer, and we'll calculate the results. Okay, just a few more seconds. Okay, and there's our results. Um, uh, the largest group is from managed care organizations, um, set followed by community-based organizations. And we had a fair number of people in others. So I would uh, ask that if you answered other to either of these poll questions, um, that when you're asked to do your evaluation at the end of the session, maybe you could add in there what your role is in the setting in which you work. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a quick uh, outline of our agenda. Um, we just did the polls. We're going to be turning it over to Dr. Agarwal to talk about improving care of individuals with dementia admitted to the hospital, then to Dr. Rose for transitions of care, empowering families in the process, and then on to Dr. Coleman for the care transitions intervention. Um, well, then, as Amy said, we'll turn it to Q&A, the post-test, and evaluation. Next slide, please. At the end of this uh, webinar, uh, the learning objectives are as follows. Participants should be able to <clears throat> describe some of the common care transitions experienced by people with dementia and the associated risks for the population, identify important strategies to prevent adverse outcomes due to poor transition, planning, or execution, and to name the key features of several current evidence-based models for care transitions. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Agarwal to get us started. Catherine? Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my focus today is going to be on uh, programs that can help us to improve the care for older adults with dementia that are in the hospital. I wanted to go over common hazards for elderly in individuals that are in the hospital uh, and talk about the benefits of programs to avoid hospitalization, as well as to describe some models of care that are beneficial to patients with dementia in the hospital, as well as to go over some key quality issues for hospitalized individuals with dementia. Next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Hospitalization is a pivotal event for anyone, but especially in the life of an older adult. Um, the hospital stay may be very detrimental to their, their physical function and cognitive function. We may bring the patient in and resolve their exacerbation of their heart failure or treat their pneumonia, but we may leave them in a state where they're much more functionally dependent on others. Next slide. So what happens in the hospital? Uh, what happens to older adults in the hospital? Unfortunately, there's a lot of things that happen in the hospital that we wish did not happen. The first is that we always introduce multiple new medications. These, of course, have lots of interactions and side effects. Patients stay in bed and become more immobile. Some of that is due to confusion, to their medical issues. Uh, and some of that is just that we uh, are negligent in getting our patients up and active as much as we should. Uh, we have uh, restraints that aren't even intended to be restraints, just IV poles and catheters and um, not having walkers and canes close by for patients to use. We also then, people tend to be going for long periods of time without being allowed to eat or drink, and so they may get dehydrated and lose some of their nutrition input. And then, of course, uh, communication can be much more difficult when patients uh, frequently do not have hearing aids or their glasses, uh, and then difficulty with eating. So it, it is very difficult for people to be in the hospital. Next slide. Um, so if the hospital wasn't risky enough by itself, it's, it's much more risky for older adults with dementia. Um, a, a nice study was published in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2012 showing that for patients with Alzheimer's dementia that the uh, risk involved for those patients is very high for delirium, um, and if that occurs, independent risk for cognitive decline, uh, nursing home placement, and death. And then patients with dementia have been clearly shown to have longer lengths of stay than other patients with similar diseases without dementia. The, the other big problem with cognitive impairment is that it's virtually invisible in the medical record. Uh, cognitive status is not documented well in general. Uh, dementia is not mentioned in the medical record of, of patients that have dementia frequently. Um, and. Uh, Many patients do not get daily uh, exams of their, their mental status or cognition. And delirium has a similar issue that, that we fail to recognize delirium uh, in one-third to two-thirds of the cases according to studies that have been published on this. Next slide. The, next, I'd like to talk to you about programs to avoid going to the hospital if possible. Sometimes uh, it's not possible to avoid, but it's worth discussing uh, trying to avoid the hospital stay. One of these is an excellent program called Hospital at Home. It is actually um, very well established in Australia, England, Canada. It's not as well established in the U.S. There is a successful program at Johns Hopkins. And uh, they have information and, and information for people to replicate this program if they're interested. But the idea is that they, uh, their goal is to help elders receive hospital level of care at home. If a patient goes to the emergency room, they are evaluated. If they are appropriate for the program, then they're actually um, sent back home in an ambulance with uh, significantly increased nursing care for the first period of time. Uh, and the medications and such that they'll need. Uh, and the outcomes have been very good for this program. Next slide. Another important thing to consider is a do not hospitalized order. order. It is a form of an advanced directive, uh, for example, in physician's orders for life-sustaining treatment, or it's labeled in different ways in different states, most for Massachusetts orders for life-sustaining treatments. Uh, this order to do not hospitalize is especially useful in a nursing home setting where it can be decided that if at all possible, we're gonna take care of problems for that patient in their, in their current setting and not send them to the hospital. 
it's definitely reasonable for frail individuals uh, with advanced dementia or other end-stage diseases, maybe coordinated with hospice. Um, and, and so it's a, it is something that should be considered in, in our patients with a more uh, comfort-oriented goal of care. Next slide. Uh, this, this has a funny picture on it. This slide is a picture of an airbag system that was created to help protect patients with a high fall risk, to support them to continue walking and doing what they need to do, but then to protect them if something goes wrong. And I think I, I'm showing this picture because I have the idea that we should have programs in the hospitals to support and protect our older adults with dementia. Uh, just like this airbag system, but to protect them in general. Um, and these, are, these programs that I'm going to go through are maybe ways that you can help look at hospitals and, and know that they are trying to give high-quality geriatric care, that they've instituted programs focused on frail older adults, uh, and these programs are helpful in specifically for patients with dementia. Next slide. The um, Alzheimer's Association developed an educational program called Dementia Friendly Hospitals, and it's a very practical, interactive educational program that gives uh, dementia training to, to all the staff in a hospital, the, the transporters, the, the nurses, the aides. It's really focused to help everyone in the hospital communicate better with patients that have cognitive impairment. Uh, and to be able to understand their needs better, to understand that they have different needs. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent program, and it's available free online at the Alzheimer's Association website. Uh, there can be assistance from local chapters. They have free modules, slides, videos. So it's an it's a, um, easily accessible program. Uh, that could be very helpful for, for hospitals to give better care to, to older adults with cognitive impairment. Next slide. The next model that I wanted to tell you about is an acute care for the elderly unit model, or ACE units. Uh, the focus of ACE units is to focus on maintaining function, to help prevent iatrogenic complications in the hospital, to try to uh, in, keep people at the current level of function and not let them decline in the hospital. And there's a lot of interdisciplinary uh, work that goes on in an ACE unit that's very important for the care. There have been several trials published on ACE units, and in summary, they, they show that functional decline is not uh, an inevitable consequence of hospitalization. It still occurs, but they can reduce how frequently it, occur it occurs. They have some evidence for decreased lengths of stay and decreased cost for the hospital. Uh, and most importantly and more consistently, they've shown that without significantly increased costs that we can return more individuals to home at a higher level of function. And so that, of course, is very important for our patients with dementia. Um, they, they do have a focus on cognitive and fu function, which they typically, ACE units will have protocols to prevent delirium and screen for delirium. They also should have protocols to manage confused patients in a restraint-free environment. Um, and there's a, a wonderful focus on interdisciplinary care involving the entire interdisciplinary team uh, to improve the care uh, of older adults in the hospital. Next slide. Uh, the next program is, is called the Hospital Elder Life Program, the HELP program, which was created by Sharon Inouye. Um, her study on this was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1999, was an outstanding study showing that simply by improving quality of care that we can prevent delirium and, and improve outcomes in hospitalized elders. Um, and patients with dementia are at extremely high risk for developing acute confusion or delirium in the hospital. And so the Hospital Elder Life Program is focused on trying to help prevent this onset of acute confusion. Uh, it is a very um, intensive program to implement, and so if a hospital has chosen to implement this program, they um, have obviously committed to a significant uh, culture change and uh, work 
Uh, they actually typically involve volunteers, but it's a lot of work to uh, train and, and uh, implement the program with the volunteers. But they've had uh, outstanding outcomes showing reduction in the delirium of incidence uh, in up to 40 percent of, of medical patients over age 70. Uh, so it's typically not instituted throughout the hospital, but more unit-based, or at least its rollout has to be unit-based. But this is an excellent program if, if you have a hospital in the area with this program. Next slide. The, the next thing I wanted to discuss was geriatric emergency rooms. Uh, there's been a rising popularity in the U.S. of geriatric emergency rooms in the last several years, and it really is important because they serve as the crossroads between inpatient and outpatient care. Um, and so that care that older adults get in the emergency room is, is critical to making sure that they either get home safely or that they have better outcomes in their stay in the hospital. Uh, I think it's the um, it's important that the, there were guidelines established in 2013 by the American College of Emergency Physicians and the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine to establish what is really needed to have a, a true geriatric emergency room. I'll caution you that sometimes you'll see advertisements for geriatric emergency rooms, but there's not as much substance behind the, the headline. Uh, and but a, a true geriatric emergency room should have significant training for their staff. They should have a medical director that has had a significant amount of increased training. They should have discharge protocols to improve communication to, to the other providers and to help not let patients get lost to follow up. They should monitor their quality um, measures very closely, like their use of urinary catheters and restraints. Um, and they should have equipment and, and environmental changes that support the needs of older adults. Next slide. So I just wanted to review some key quality issues for hospitals to improve the care of patients with dementia. Uh, some things that, that are important that hospitals should have and things that you might suggest to your hospital. The first is this, the identification and involvement of caregivers. Sometimes it's not evident that there is a caregiver and that, um, and that they need to be contacted for decisions, et cetera. So it's very important that the caregivers are, are noted in the electronic medical record and that there are signs in the rooms and on the chart to, to involve the caregivers with decisions and education. The next is that the hospital should have a focus on improving mobility and prevention of functional decline not automatically placing urinary catheters, for example, making sure that patients are getting up and, and moving. Another great program is called the Geriatric um, Resource Nurses that are part of the NICHE program. The Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing also has some wonderful programs that they have put out there. Um, and a Geriatric Resource Nurse program provides some expert consultations to all the nurses in the hospital uh, on geriatrics issues. Next slide. Uh, another, I, I have this picture here to, to think of delirium or acute confusional states in the hospital as that canary in the coal mine, that it's a sign that someone is really sick. And it's really important that hospitals have ways to screen for and look for delirium so that they have early recognition, that the providers have been educated on delirium, and to realize that delirium uh, is frequently superimposed on dementia and that they can manage confused patients in the safest way possible by trying to avoid restraints um, and using sitters and behavioral techniques to help improve the care of those patients. Next slide. Uh, also in delirium prevention, they should have hearing amplifiers and glasses available to patients. The pharmacy really should have efforts to decrease the use of inappropriate medications um, involving caregivers in education and having visitor, visiting hours to allow caregivers to stay overnight if possible, and then efforts to help in, improve day-night cycles. Next slide. Uh, lastly, of course, as we have to think about how patients leave the hospital, and there, ha there really needs to be strong collaborative efforts to uh, communicate with care providers that are outside the hospital. Discharge education needs to involve caregivers. They need to establish the appointments prior to discharge. 
um, and have follow-up programs for the home and the skilled nursing settings to make sure that we have optimal transitions of care with phone calls and other programs like the Care Transitions Intervention, which is an outstanding program that you'll hear about soon. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Karen Rose. Thank you. Thank you. I plan to spend the next few minutes exploring the roles of families in care transitions and ways that providers can assist family members as they navigate the health care system. So in 2014, what we know is that there were almost 16 million family members and other unpaid caregivers of people with Alzheimer's disease who provided an estimated 18 billion hours of unpaid care. And again, that's billion with a B. Um, and conservatively, this came in, these unpaid hours of care had a value of almost $218 billion. We know, too, that caregivers of persons with Alzheimer's disease provide care for a longer time on average than caregivers of older adults with other conditions. We know, too, that caregiving takes a toll on families, that on the one side, families um, do report positive aspects of caregiving, such as family togetherness and certainly a satisfaction from helping their loved one. On the flip side of that coin, though, we know that family caregivers do experience high levels of stress. In fact, over half of all family caregivers say that the emotional stress that they are experiencing is high or very high. So again, we need to treat family caregivers with respect and handle them with care. Next slide, please. So what do families want? Um, First, and most importantly, families want to be in the know. They want to be informed, they want to be heard, they want to be ready, and they want to know what supportive services are available to them and how to access them. I believe it's very important that we not make assumptions about what families know. For example, a transfer to or from one setting to another can be a very traumatic event for families, so we need to address this with them with um, complete understanding. And certainly beyond financial implications, which are significant, transferring care from one setting to another can be incredibly stressful for family members. There's often a sense of loss and failure and uncertainty. Next slide. So how do we best keep families informed? Again, we cannot over-communicate with family members, and I use the adage kind of early and often, speaking to family members early in the process and often to reinforce information is very helpful. Again, not making assumptions. For example, just because um, a person, the person with dementia was admitted from a nursing home, say nursing home A, doesn't mean that the family wants them to return to nursing home A or that that's even an option depending upon the needs of the care recipients. And families may not always understand that. So they need to know what the plan is for discharge, when, where, under what circumstances. They need open and honest communication about what the care recipient needs and an assessment of who is truly best able to provide that care. And they need sensitivity because this is, can be a very difficult time for families. Families may now find themselves in the, in the place where they need to have some difficult conversations with other family members that they've been avoiding or putting off. Um, so again, this is a, a critically a sensitive time for families. Next slide. So how to hear families, and I know that I'm speaking to an audience of largely social workers, and so I've, on some level I believe I'm preaching to the choir, but I, because I know that you all do this so very, very well. But what families um, need from us are they need for us to ask their opinions. They need to be able to express what they want, what is in the best interest they believe for their care recipient, what are the um, wishes and the desires of both the person with the disease and with their family, what will work and what won't, what are their supportive services, and for how often and how long can they really rely on some of their support sy systems. We need to summarize discussions and restate decisions at every meeting that we have with family members providing them and, and our medical records with written documentation so that all providers are in the know. 
and we certainly do need to everyone enlist the assistance from other from others in the healthcare team, social workers, other supportive staff, chaplains, and other therapists. Next slide, please. Families often discuss that they weren't ready um, to, to, for their loved one to be discharged to them or to wherever they're being discharged. And so I think that it's really important that we help families be ready for this transition. Again, communicating early and often, in person and in writing, and helping pl family members plan for what-if situations. I'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. Families need to know how they can best be organized to be ready for whatever situations arise. And I believe that one of the most important aspects of that is to help them organize a patient file. That file would include a current list of medications, chronic medical conditions, follow-up appointment dates, and certainly enough paper, blank paper, so that they can document any new information that they receive, any new instructions um, that they receive along the way. Two, it's important to discuss realistic expectations about roles of family members in an atmosphere that, provoke, that promotes guilt-free discussions. Certainly taking into consideration that family members that may have other obligations, work, family, their own health. So helping families be become very realistic about what they can and cannot really take on becomes vitally important. Next slide. A lot of work has been done now on how we need to help families be ready, for example, for um, visits with their providers. And so there are some pr best practices that are out there and available for family members. Reminders such that not going to healthcare providers by themselves, that two ears and two eyes are certainly better than one, that they should have a place to document questions that they might have for their healthcare providers so that they remember to ask them, and then a place, too, to document what, the, what answers they receive. It's also helpful to um, remind families that they need to anticipate any care recipient needs that their loved one might have in route um, or while at the health care provider visit. Sometimes families travel great distances to get to health care providers and they really need some additional help for how to anticipate what needs their loved one might have. I think it's important to give families a sense that they don't have to do this alone. In fact, that it's in their loved one's best interest for them not to do this part alone, that to take another family member, a, ne a neighbor, a, um, a beloved friend, anyone with them to help them. Um, and to help family members realize, too, that going to visit the health care provider can be exhausting for everyone, for care recipients and caregivers. So they need to um, plan accordingly. Next slide, please. So the what-if situations. I think it's very important for providers to give family members parameters, if you will, for some commonly occurring scenarios, things like de delirium, falls, incontinence, and to speak of them um, not using medical jargon. So instead of talking about delirium, saying confusion, instead of maybe incontinence, talking about having accidents or urinating, something like that. And helping families to be realistic about their plans for how much assistance they can and cannot provide. And to remember that it's their choice. Um, to give family members a sense that not every emergency may mean that they need to go to the emergency room. So providing them with ways to think through some likely occurrences. And I believe what we know from the literature and from our own kind of common sense is that to the extent that we can help families keep their regularly scheduled appointments with their health care providers, that this hopefully avoids visits to emergency rooms. Next slide, please. Family members need to know that there are supportive services available for them in their communities, but they may need help in accessing them and knowing how to access them. I've listed here on the slide some com typical community resources that are available for families and that can be critically important for them. For example, their local area agency on aging, which may include access to Meals on Wheels and nutritional supplements. Certainly, the, uh, there's a local Alzheimer's Association, 
access to respite services, both in-home and facility-based. There's certainly volunteer services, oftentimes available through churches, organizations, and here in my um, city, there is even a university-based respite volunteer service available, and that's not uncommon. Family members need to know that there are adult daycare settings and that there are some web-based certainly resources for them. One that I particularly like is entitled Senior Navigator, and so you can Google that. And there are other web-based services. Senior Navigator provides an enormous amount of information for families, both spouses and partners and children and grandchildren who are taking care of their loved one with Alzheimer's disease. So I think particularly when we start thinking about distance caregiving situations, families need to know that there are some web-based services that can keep them in the know and anticipating what might be helpful for their um, loved one. Just a word of caution here too, too, too often I see that family members are, cert are given just a handout, if you will, a written piece of paper with a whole long lo laundry list of community-based resources, and, and that's not overly helpful. Families don't know how to access these when it's appropriate to access them. And so some conversation around what these resources are, and, and even to the extent possible, specific names of people are very helpful. Next slide. Around special needs transferring from and back to an assisted living or nursing home setting, again, I think it's all about communication. And a point of um, real uh, challenge is that around medication changes. That seems to be an area where we slip up. And so being very explicit about medication changes is helpful. Next slide. As persons are maybe transferring from home with home health care providers, families get very confused over what that service is and isn't. When family members hear home health, oftentimes they think someone's coming in every day, all day to take care of their every need. And that simply, as we all know, isn't the case. So families need to know really the parameters around what the services will be that they'll be receiving for how long and what their role might be in arranging this and scheduling this. Next slide, please. Again, in any setting, I think that it's imperative that clear communication, documentation about any changes in medications, advanced directives, wound care, feeding, and toileting be made. Um, if a setting has provided care for the person in the past, the, this, that setting wants to know what's different, what's changed, what stayed the same. Next slide. Caring for the caregiver is everyone's job. Creating a supportive, non-threatening, guilt-free atmosphere is key for family caregivers. We can all do our part by reinforcing the notion that the best care for the care recipient is not always provided at home and helping family members really um, realistically assess what care they can and cannot provide safely. And then certainly the importance of active listening. Next slide. Helping a families adjust to the new normal means helping families see the big picture of dementia, helping them understand that Alzheimer's disease is a progressive debilitating disease, that care needs will change, that likely as, as time goes on, they will need to enlist assistance from others. And starting the conversation about embracing palliative versus curative ways of thinking as appropriate to the situation. All of these things really do help families adjust to the new normal and give them permission um, to ask questions in a non-threatening environment. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Coleman. Great, thank you. Well, um, in front of me in my office, I have the bylaws of the Alan Stevens Fan Club. Uh, and on page three, paragraph two, it so states that should Alan Stevens not be available for a speaking engagement, that the president of his fan club will stand in in his stead. And as president of the Alan Stevens Fan Club, I'm pleased to be on this call. Um, but seriously, uh, Alan's absence, I think, speaks volumes about not only his professional commitment to family caregiving, but to his personal commitment. And for that, uh, we, we miss him, but uh, I will try to carry on uh, as best as I can as Alan. Both Katie and Karen did a remarkable job of uh, presenting uh, highly substantive, very compelling work, uh, and I hope to uh, contribute similarly through Alan's slides. Um, they also managed to be on time, which is quite remarkable in and of itself. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so we're going to discuss an evidence-based model, uh, the care transitions intervention that's developed here in the program that I run in Colorado. Um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, I think, universal truths of this model is that its simplicity is both its uh, biggest asset and its biggest liability. Uh, from a distance, people say, oh, yeah, 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 that's what we do. Oh, wait, 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 there's some home visits and uh, phone calls um, after the hospital. Right, that's what we do. Um, what I'm hoping to do in our time together is to sort of call out what makes this unique um, and how um, employing this model uh, in the context of individuals with dementia and their family caregivers uh, is something for which we have been uh, expanding upon and, and developing further evidence. Um, so as it stands, um, this model is unique from the standpoint that it is <clears throat> focused on building self-care skills using something that we refer to as coaching. Coaching is a term that's uh, been widely used since then, and I'll make some distinctions about what we're uh, after when we talk about coaching. But this is designed to encourage and support both older patients and their family members assert a more active role in their care transitions. When we think about uh, the experience of moving across care settings, uh, uh, certainly once people return to their home or to the community, um, we realize that there's you know, 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week, which adds up quickly to 168 hours. And of those 168 hours, the vast majority, probably 160 or more, uh, these individuals are on their own. There's no health professionals running around. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is rather than just come in and fix problems in the moment, we're really looking at ways of building the capacity of the individual and their family uh, to be able to respond to common transition problems themselves. This slide, uh, which I sort of reminds me of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, gives us a, uh, a sense of just how many care settings we're talking about. Um, it's very easy to see uh, that individuals need uh, additional skills to be able to, to navigate. We sometimes think about people going home and now they need to manage their chronic illness like diabetes or heart failure, but also by default, most of them become care coordinators. Next slide. Uh, so the care transitions intervention uh, has gone through multiple rigorous randomized controlled trials. We've been trying did this with diverse patient populations. Um, and ultimately, uh, we're able to demonstrate reductions in 30-day readmissions, but also because this is designed to be a model that, that, that improves capacity for self-care, that these efforts are sustained. Uh, that is to say that uh, if you sort of using the proverb, teach someone to fish, that those benefits uh, occur both today as well as downstream. And so our evidence suggests that, that not only can you reduce 30-day readmissions, which is where the mark is currently, but also uh, out as far as uh, six months. Um, but this whole focus on skill transfer, coaching, equals skill transfer. Uh, in order to do this, uh, there are sort of two important caveats uh, to coaching. One is that the individual who's uh, functioning in the role of the coach needs to have the skills in the first place. Uh, and the majority of our coaches are nurses, social workers, occupational therapists. Uh, but secondly, there needs to be some mechanism to determine if those skills uh, have been imparted. There needs to be metrics and tools, and, and all that is available as part of this intervention. So we're trying to impart skills and confidence. <laughs> Next slide. So this individual called a transitions coach uh, is not there to come in and fix problems, uh, but rather in keeping with the proverb to, to teach people to fish. The coach does not provide skilled services, uh, but rather is there to, to really build the skills and the capacity of the individual and their family caregiver towards self-management. Now, we often uh, hear people refer to this model as the four pillars model, and, and although there are four pillars embedded in this model, um, it, it's a little bit of a misleading to say this is the four pillars model because what ends up happening is it sort of by default becomes sort of a checklist. And, and I just want to emphasize that this is really not about a checklist. Uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. But, but the, not to disregard the four pillars, the four pillars 
uh, are what came out of some qualitative work we did earlier with individuals and their families about what are the areas that you feel you would like to be more confident in. And this is the keeping a personal health record. I'll elaborate that in a moment. Medication review, I'll say more about that. Red flags and follow-up. So I will talk about the four pillars. They are part of the model, but really the essence of the model is about skill transfer. Um, next slide, please. All right, let's keep it right there for a minute. The other distinguishing, oops, can we go back one, please? Sorry, I was waiting for that little graphic to come in. Excellent. The other, I think, distinguishing factor of the model has to do with the goal. There certainly are, in a lot of corridors in healthcare now, we're talking about goals. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, however, the goals are sort of determined or, or predetermined. Um, you have diabetes, so your goal is to reduce your hemoglobin A1C blood test. In the care transitions intervention, the goal is an open-ended question. In fact, we don't even say health goal. We say personal goal. Uh, we've recently completed some work uh, with patients and families and found that 70% of people who just came out of the hospital with a chronic illness exacerbation did not have a goal related to their health. Uh, in other words, people have goals related to quality, quality of life, to their relationships, to their avocations. Um, and these goals are remarkably powerful because they give uh, the coach and others who are involved in this person's care a sense of what's important, a sense of what motivates them, uh, and, and that most of us do not define ourselves by our chronic illnesses. Next slide, please. Personal health record is, is one of those four pillars that's not universally used. Um, there certainly are instances where they're because of language or literacy or otherwise that this may or may not be applicable. But in most cases, the, the, the real thrust of the personal health record is to reinforce the individual and their family asserting a more active role in their care. And this becomes sort of a very tangible tool for how this gets done. The goal is prominently featured in the personal health record. I'll talk a little bit about medication reconciliation from the patient standpoint, and, we'll talk, and that, of course, becomes part of this record, as well as the warning signs or red flags and uh, information on how to, uh, who the family caregivers are and how to reach them. Next slide, please. Let's talk about medications. Uh, to my watch, it's been over 10 years since we've had mandated medication reconciliation in our facilities. Uh, and yet, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, 10 years later, we've actually made relatively little progress on reducing the number of errors or discrepancies that occur by the time these individuals get home. Uh, so what's going on here? We're putting a lot of effort into this. These are smart people. They're nurses and social workers and physicians trying to reconcile meds before the patient leaves, and yet the patient gets home and it's like a whole other world. Uh, there are all those medications that were still exactly where they were when the individual got whisked away to go to the hospital or the emergency department. Uh, so what we do through the care transitions intervention is to start off with, we avoid the tendency to walk into the patient's home, point to a list of medicines that were printed from the electronic health record, and ask, are these the medicines you are taking? Because the answer is always yes. <laughs> But rather, we walk in with no such list in hand, and we ask an open-ended question. I like to know what medicines you take, how you take them. By the way, no need to say anything to try to please me. Once that step occurs and the patient begins to trust the coach, that the coach is not there to judge them, the coach is not there to wave their finger at them and say, how come you're not doing this or that, but just let's get out the list of what you're taking. Now there's an opportunity for the coach and patient to look at that list that the hospital thinks they should take and go through and identify where those discrepancies are. Uh, nurses, social workers, occupational therapists can all do this. You don't have to have an encyclopedic knowledge of medications. In fact, you're really just cross-referencing as we go. And then once those discrepancies are identified, you need a plan for what's going to happen, how are those going to be communicated. And so part of the coaching is also to give individuals the language uh, and also the understanding that, that, uh, of where they can reach out to to get some clarity on their medications. Next slide, please. Uh, red flags, uh, this is fairly self-evident. Uh, what are the things you need to watch for? Uh, but perhaps even more importantly, we don't spend as much time on talking about what do you do. 
And what do you do differently when it's 2 p.m. on a Tuesday versus 2 a.m. on a Sunday? Uh, and how would you go about seeking care under that circumstances? Next slide, please. Uh, Follow-up appointment. One of the things we learned in our qualitative work is that a, a lot of times patients are a little bit bewildered about why they need a follow-up appointment. Gee, I was just in that hospital. There are nurses and doctors and technicians and therapists crawling all over me. Why do I need to go to an appointment? Um, so interestingly, when we sort of look at why people don't go to appointments, um, we certainly look at important things like transportation and co-pays, but another is that the individual sort of feels like I've been over-treated or at least treated enough for the time being. Um, so part of what our coaches do is, is reinforce the value of these appointments, but from their standpoint, what, what are they going to get out of the appointment? Because a lot of these folks have been down this road before, and their follow-up appointment just becomes the primary care or the specialist asking them, confirming here's what happened in the hospital, and the patients and families don't see a lot of value. So we try to add the, the patient, uh, encourage them to help establish the agenda so there is value. Next slide, please. Um, here's a case study that Alan put together, a 63-year-old woman who was hospitalized for sepsis. She was basically brought in overnight, uh, and we're going to walk through this together. Her home visit, the phone call number one, phone call number two. Um, what you'll notice on all these encounters between the coach and the patient and the coach and the family is that the first agenda item is always the goal. This is not something that we ask and then note and then put away somewhere, uh, filed away, that this is always top of mind and this is the main thrust of all the encounters. The goal really drives all subsequent uh, agenda. Uh, in this case, in the home, the personal health record was introduced. As they went through that exercise with the medication I mentioned, they identified 11 medication discrepancies, which um, unfortunately is not uncommon. Um, also learned that the patient was struggling getting an appointment at the time they needed to, uh, and before the visit was over, they went over red flags and what to do if those red flags occur. For the phone call, again, the goal and the progress along the goal was, uh, was job number one, uh, and then they had an opportunity to go over how that follow-up appointment went, were there any medications changed, um, and then uh, what communication seemed to go well, what didn't go so well, and where needed to practice, rehearse, role play that. And on the follow-up phone call, again, the goal is top of the list. Um, and here on this call, the patient was beginning to develop some of those red flags. And so there was an opportunity uh, to not only make sure the individual was getting uh, the attention that they needed sort of in the moment, but also prepare them for a future time when maybe the coach didn't just happen to call. The individual would know what to do. Next slide, please. Uh, so these slides sort of reiterate what we just talked about, but also show you what's happening in between. So after the home visit, there was a follow-up visit. Follow-up visit, uh, uh, there was uh, the recognition that the patient was told to stop a medication in the hospital uh, that may or may not have been uh, communicated to the primary care, and so that this uh, patient's level of preparation and their personal health record helped positively influence their course of treatment. Next slide, please. And similarly, between the phone call, um, there was an opportunity uh, to reinforce uh, what the patient took away from that visit. Again, what went well, what didn't go so well, uh, but also the fact that in many cases, uh, when we think something has been addressed or dealt with, it may or may not necessarily be the final chapter. And so in this case, the urinary tract symptoms persisted, and there was an opportunity uh, to coach the patient through this. Next slide, please. Um, in my remaining minutes, I want to uh, share with you that um, our initial work supported by the John A. Hartford Foundation, our subsequent work supported by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, where we really wanted to more deliberately uh, involve family caregivers. From the very beginning, we've included family caregivers, but we also realize that there are some uh, customization or tailoring that we need when the patient is either unable to be coached or prefers not to be coached and would defer that to a, a family caregiver. Um, <clears throat> we uh, are pleased to collaborate with Gary Epstein LeBeau, who did a study in Rhode Island where the care transition intervention was rolled out, where he noted that when a family member was present, uh, whether or not that was the primary target for the coaching or not, that the acceptance rate went up. Next slide, please. 
when we uh, did a series of focus groups that included family members of individuals with dementia, we learned a lot about what their needs are, and I think some of this echoes what we heard from Karen around readiness and, and around their identity and involvement, and this helped us um, really, I think, more customize the model for family caregivers. Um, <clears throat> for example, uh, having the family caregiver's goal also be part of the agenda um, and uh, helping the family member feel more confident and prepared for what's coming up, being able to anticipate next steps. Um, we've published this work and the references at the bottom, but we were able to demonstrate that when you involve family caregivers in this way, not only do you see greater activation, quite remarkable increases in activation around common uh, care transition uh, um, tasks, but also um, identification and reconciliation of medication problems, a rise in, in care transition measure scores that's now part of HCAPs and value-based purchasing, and also goal attainment for the patient as well as for the family. Next slide. Uh, we invite you to come visit our website, caretransitions.org, where you can learn all sorts of additional uh, information about the care transitions intervention, watch a, a coach in action, download some of our tools, and learn about training and technical assistance. Uh, with that, I'll turn us over to Renee, and uh, I think we'll move into our next section. Thank you, Eric. Uh, clearly, your presidency of the Dr. Alan Stevens Fan Club is well-deserved. So I also wanted to extend a, a, a deep uh, thank you to Catherine and Karen for your really wonderfully rich and informative presentations. So I know that there are so many questions from the audience. So with this, I will turn it back over to Amy Herr from Lewin, uh, from the Lewin Group, who will moderate the answer, the question and answer session. Amy? Great. Thanks, Renee. And thanks to all of our speakers for an excellent presentation today. Um, as, as Renee said, we're going to turn our attention to questions um, in just a minute here. But I wanted to let everyone know if you're um, seeking CME and CE credit, you can now um, complete the, uh, the post-test using the widget at the bottom of your screen. And as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier in the call, you must score 80% or higher on the post-test um, to receive credit. So you have two attempts. And you have until 2 p.m. Eastern time. You have one hour from right now to take and, and pass that test. Um, you will also need to complete the webinar evaluation um, survey to receive the CME and CE credit. And that evaluation is um, available on, on the widgets at the bottom of your screen as well. For those of you that are not seeking credit, you can um, complete the evaluation uh, starting at this time as well. Okay, so we wanted to turn our attention to some of the questions that came in via the, the Q&A function on the WebEx. And um, feel free to continue to send in those questions as you have them. Um, our first question is for um, Dr. Rose. Um, as you might remember from the earlier poll that we had, there's a lot of our participants that are from managed care organizations. And there's a question here, um, do you have any recommendations for health plans that can build on the effective connections that you spoke about um, and how to help health plans connect um, individuals with supportive community resources? Okay, terrific. Um, so I want to be sure I understand the questions around, am I aware of any health plans? specific health plans that help build on the community resource no. piece? Is that the question? No. Do you have any recommendations for health plan staff who are trying to oh. uh, connect individuals with community resources? Oh, okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I think that it's really important to, to get to know the people on these community resource lists, if you will, um, by um, calling them, talking to them, visiting them, figuring out, because just going by what's present or what they have available maybe on their website isn't always accurate. I mean, I think we all know that. And oftentimes it doesn't really give the details. And so I think that however you connect, um, you know, face-to-face -face or over the phone 
with these community resources, that's really important um, so, that, so that you really do understand what resources they have because it, it, they change. The resources certainly change over time. Funding streams change, that kind of thing. Um, even locations change, and their website doesn't even have the right, lo you know, the right address that you're giving people. Um, so I, I think that there just needs to be a systematic kind of undertaking of you know, every six months, every year, something going through that list and calling and getting updated information. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next question is for Dr. Coleman. Um, can you speak about how the, um, the CTI model applies to people with dementia? Um, specifically, how is the person with dementia engaged in addition to the family caregivers in making decisions? Right, excellent, thank you. Um, and just to tag on to um, Karen's last response, I added to the chat an article that Nancy Whitelaw, who formerly of the National Council on Aging, and I wrote trying to help uh, at a very operation level um, practices uh, discover and collaborate with community-based organizations. Um, but on to the, the question at hand. So um, if an individual uh, has moderate to advanced cognitive impairment, um, we uh, still would like them to benefit from the care transitions intervention, but, but in that instance, it, it, uh, we would really uh, ideally try to involve uh, one or more family caregivers as a result. Um, but even though we may um, spend a fair amount of our time coaching the family members, it's not that we sort of turn our attention completely away from the individual with cognitive impairment. Um, there's actually some pretty good data in the literature that suggests that individuals, even with moderate advanced dementia, can formulate goals that are meaningful to them that reflect their view of quality of life. And so, um, you know, the goal setting, which I mentioned, is really paramount to the model itself, would, of course, include uh, the individual as well as their family members. Um, and, you know, when possible, we, we don't sort of make assumptions. We uh, give the individual with cognitive impairment an opportunity to participate, but usually doing it in a sort of a collaborative way with their family. We don't sort of automatically assume um, that, that, you know, they're not involved in their own care. We, you know, it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, to try to do this uh, together collaboratively. So the short answer is uh, if an individual has moderate to advanced cognitive impairment but does not have an identified family caregiver, they're probably not a great fit for this model. Uh, on the other hand, if they do have uh, willing and able to engage family members, um, we have learned quite a bit about how to engage both simultaneously, and the goals are really a great way to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Agarwal. Um, can you speak about this, that any special considerations for hospitals um, and managing care transitions, care transitions in rural communities? Hmm. Um, I was trying to think of how to, I was wondering if the concern might be more in regards to transitions to home or transitions to skilled nursing facilities. I, I'll try to speak to both. I, I've definitely seen multiple examples of the Interact program for transitions of care to skilled nursing facilities and rehabilitation units, and I've seen those work very well in rural and in um, more uh, metropolitan areas. Um, so the Interact program is something that uh, I think is a very good communication tool between hospitals and uh, facilities to improve the transitions of care. Um, in regards to transitions to home, um, I think that uh, I, I think Dr. Coleman, I, I'll ask him to pipe in next on this. I have understood that the care transitions intervention has been demonstrated in some more rural areas. Um, and I know that it's successful in many places. Um, but the other may be um, also working with area agency on aging um, programs uh, that uh, have adopted different care transitions interventions that, that can be helpful. Um, and then I think also um, in more rural areas, follow-up phone calls if really done in a 
thoughtful and careful way, I think having a group of nurses that are focused on the care transition that do follow-up phone calls to patients and caregivers after the hospital stay and then helping, helping those patients in more than just are you feeling okay, but have you gotten your medications filled? If not, how can I help you, you know, actually meaningful ways of trying to help understand what are their barriers to uh, implementing the programs that were uh, initiated at discharge. Um, somebody calling, that a group of nurses that call from the hospital that have access to the medical record and know what the discharge plan was um, and what are the issues, and then to be able to try to help families with those barriers. Um, so it would not be just the simple, are you happy, phone call after discharge, but uh, a more uh, focused and maybe repeating phone calls after discharge to try to address the issues. A lot of times patients just aren't able to get the appointment made, uh, and so sometimes follow-up phone calls can help them get the follow-up appointments made that they need to have made um, and also get them connected to other community resources. Uh, our group of nurses that call after discharge are also active in getting patients connected to community resources as well. Great. Thanks, Dr. Agarwal. Um, Dr. Coleman, would you like to add anything to that response? Yeah, and um, boy, uh, as though we don't miss Alan enough on this call, Alan really has been a champion in, in helping all of us learn how to spread the CTI into rural areas, particularly uh, rural parts of Texas. Um, since then, we have <clears throat> uh, now I've experienced in other states as well, but the, the model uh, does work uh, in rural settings. And as Katie pointed out, sometimes you do need to make adjustments just because of the, the, the distances. Um, we have uh, had some experience trying to sort of graph this model onto a telehealth experience. And, and so far, I, you know, my uh, uh, sort of encapsulated view of telehealth is that it certainly has a lot of advantages, particularly when it comes to sharing information and communicating professional, professional, and professional to uh, care recipient. Um, I, I guess I remain unconvinced that we can use telehealth for some of the, the skill transfer uh, uh, behavioral change uh, that we're trying to get to, but we, we continue to learn and hopefully we'll have some breakthroughs. Great, thank you very much. Um, we don't have any further questions, so I just as a reminder for our participants, um, for those of you seeking CME and CE credit, um, please complete the post-test by 2 p.m. Eastern Time and the post-webinar evaluation by 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And for everyone, um, please complete the, um, the post-webinar evaluation um, your feedback is really important to help us improve our upcoming events. Um, the slides from today's presentation, a recording and a transcript will be available shortly on the resources for integratedcare.com website. Um, and we appreciate your participation today. So thank you again very much to our speakers and for all the participants. Have a great afternoon. That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Teleconference. You may now disconnect.